tea. Hello, humans. Welcome to my new office. Things are a little bit unsettled at the moment. Uh, there's no heat, there's no electricity because, the, well, there's marginal electricity in a couple of places. No lighting, so I won't be able to adjust that much. Uh, in a minute, I'll pick it up and when I'm all done with this little talk, pick it up and walk it around and uh, uh, show you the extent of the office. It's pretty cool. I mean, it, as you can see, it's a, something of a gymnasium as well. Uh, all of this is interrelated with the subject of today's discussion, uh, not the cold. Well, cold too, I suppose, but... <coughs> um, anyway, this is a, um, by way of introduction, sort of a talk. Uh, getting back into these, and um, <laughs> i got to show you that. I mean, that's, it's kind of funny to look at. That's my ceiling up there. All of those little holes are where I'm supposed to have some light fixtures. Uh, this is all related, really, uh, so I'll jump into that aspect of it. The nature of... Um, uh, hang on. Ah, screw it. I'll deal with that later. I've got good Wi-Fi coverage that's interrelated as well uh, to the subject of this um, discussion, which is attitude adjustment. Uh, this is by way of a warning, by way of an introduction. You, you may find over the next few months that you're not going to want to pay much attention to me. You're not going to like me very much. My formerly uh, shy and retiring nature uh, has faded. It's gone. It's, it's, <laughs> it's dust. It's dead. It died with the tumor that they cut out of me. Um, but I didn't know it then. It took a while. Uh, so I got, got the, I went in on Friday the 13th, uh, 40 miles of um, emergency transport to a hospital and then emergency surgery as soon as I got there and they hauled out this great bloody tumor and, and I survived. Okay, so I survived that part of cancer. So in that sense, I'm a cancer survivor uh, coming on, uh, you know, going on a year now or heading up into a year in July. So. Uh, seven months, something like that. Um, good enough at this stage, uh, but the, this discussion is about attitude adjustment and some um, quick and dirty intros to some things you can do if you're a cancer patient at the moment, if you're also a cancer survivor, if you're what, what I call one of um, the select few, and if you're afraid of getting cancer, I've got some um, information that is really fucking valuable. And this is part of my attitude as well. Uh, it turns out, all right, so, so there's this really interesting guy. His name is Al Alexander Solzhenitsyn. He's a uh, great writer. In the 70s and 80s, he wrote a bunch of books called, um, a trilogy called uh, Gulag Archipelago. And the Gulag Archipelago uh, was all about uh, the former Siberian uh, prison system uh, where the um, Ruski government dis decided that they needed to populate Siberia in order to hold it against Chinese advances. So they criminalized all kinds of activity, rounded up all kinds of people, and shoved them into gulags and made them work the land, basically, in, in Siberia as a, um, uh, uh, a tenant hold on a uh, claim to the property uh, on the part of Russia way the hell to the west. So anyway, though... Um, uh, he also wrote a book called The Cancer Ward. The reason he wrote it was that he uh, ended up with testicular cancer and he cured himself of testicular cancer with a very interesting concoction. And you can go look for an article on um, the internet uh, called, um, uh, I think it's called Did Alexander Solz Solzhenitsyn Cure Himself of Testicular Cancer? Something along those lines. Uh, that kind of a search should bring it up for you. And it's an article written by a guy, a doctor, who was working in a, um, a research uh, role in cancer at the time. Sorry about the sound and stuff. You know, I mean, this is basically an empty building, as I'll show you at the end of this business. Uh, and I can't control the light. We're dealing with natural light because I've only got two pl plug-ins, and it's risky for me to do anything else here. Again, part of the attitude adjustment issue I'll get to in a minute. So Solzhenitsyn goes and um, he gets stuck into a cancer ward, and he cures himself. 
using a, a concoction that's put into that um, uh, article. Uh, he wrote, put a lot of this stuff in, in this book called The Cancer Ward. And in his book, the, the ward, the hospital, the cancer hospital, uh, is um, uh, an analog or a metaphor for the uh, Soviet state. And the behavior of the people inside are the uh, representative behaviors of um, uh, the Soviet people relative to their government and how they felt and this sort of thing. There's layers upon layers upon layers in there. If you have cancer and, and if you're a cancer survivor, you may not want to read this book. He's an extremely powerful writer. And um, uh, I'm not rereading it. I'm only looking at a couple of specific chapters related to chaga mushroom and then the cure that this guy goes through with the testicular cancer. Now, my cancer was in my gut. This turns out to be the, uh, one of the more insidious, mostly fatal um, types of cancer because it can grow for a long time, giving you symptoms for a long damn time that, that in my case are not, were not diagnosed. And we're talking on the order of two decades and um, maybe three decades, really. Uh, and the, um, uh, and usually by the time they discover it, it's, it's too fucking late. You're toast. So I'm one of the very lucky few that has come out of this. Uh, curiously, and, and also um, a part of this is that, that I now know seven of my cohorts, seven people that are, let's say, around a range of uh, uh, basically in our 60s, but one of the guys is an outlier in that he had this happen to him when he's like 52. Uh, so uh, there are seven of us, and we've all had some form of gut cancer, except for one, uh, two guys. Uh, one guy had gut cancer and skin cancer, and the other guy had a um, uh, very nasty skin cancer, invasive skin cancer. Uh, but in, in all cases here, uh, we're all come across, they'd all happened in 2018 for all of us. And so uh, mine was July 13th, I've gotten seven months beyond that. Uh, some of the guys, uh, one of the guys was January. Uh, there was a guy in March. So we've been pretty well staggered throughout the year uh, up to about September or so. So my uh, seven um, samurai survivors here, people that have, have literally gutted it through uh, incredible pain to then collapse and end up going to a, an emergency room, all because there was no level of diagnoses um, within their life that they had that cancer. And these are all slow growing cancers including the skin cancer this guy had. Um, uh, so all of us have survived, and uh, um, uh, I'm sort of cross-comparing notes as well as doing my own research. The reason I'm doing my research is I don't trust these doctors, okay? I'm a true scientist in the sense that Richard Feynman defines the term, and that definition of the term is that a scientist is someone who does not trust that the experts know what the fuck they're talking about and therefore fact checks them. And when they find out, as most often these researchers do, these scientists do, that those experts are wrong, then they set out to prove them wrong and where, why, and how. So in that sense, I'm a, I'm a sci scientist and I'm using some of uh, Richard Feynman. He's this famous physicist, if you're too young to know. Um, using some of his techniques uh, for uh, self-learning, okay? He has this idea that uh, was uh, square R3, okay? And it's um, survey, question, uh, read, uh, recite, and review. And uh, so you survey the whole field, reading little bits and pieces of the whole field of the domain of knowledge you want to um, uh, encompass and take in. Then you ask yourself the questions that you know right now you can't answer and you write them all down. So you have 10 or 12. You don't have to get very extensive in this because they'll change almost instantly. Uh, but you write down questions you can't, about that field you can't answer. Like, you know, what is cancer? How does it arise? Um, you know, what was the thinking on it 50 years ago? What was the thinking on it 100 years ago? Um, permutations, etc., etc., etc. And then you survey all parts of the field to see where there is knowledge that makes sense and to learn to pick up the jargon. Because every, every one of these places has a huge level of jargon that you've got to um, uh, learn as you go along on this. Sorry about the lighting, guys. I'll get something in here in the next few days. Um, anyway, so um, I'm doing the survey of cancer and all of this kind of thing, and I come across two things. 
in, in, in one which reminded me of the Cancer Ward novel by Solzhenitsyn, which was autobiographical to a great degree, um, but in which, over the first five, I think, or six chapters, you, you get a gradual sense, following these two or three particular characters, um, that there's something happening to them beyond simply the cancer itself. And this is uh, reflected in the attitude of the Soviet state that ultimately led to the collapse of the Soviet state. In this case here, the, um, what's going on is an attitude adjustment. And I've discovered that it's happening to myself. And this attitude adjustment as a cancer survivor is that at some point it dawns on you that a cancer diagnosis wants any time, um, anything, uh, any time it ever has happened to you, you need to understand that that's basically a death sentence. That if you have a can, and, in, and it occurs to you, damn, I survived cancer. But, and then you go through the survivor's guilt. You get, first, you've got to go through the recovery, I mean, which was just brutal, just absolutely brutal. And then, uh, then you get to the point where you're sort of feeling okay, and then you go through all of the emotional stuff, and then you start realizing, uh, if you're self-analytical, that, oh, shit, something's going on internally that is changing how the you uh, that is yourself is reacting to its own I-ness and how that I-ness is expressing itself out as your personality into the world. And that's why I'm basically giving everybody a heads up. Saying, I'm, you know, there's a core of me that's a raspy bastard that hasn't been let out in, and has not uh, gotten its due and needs to. And then as part of this attitude adjustment, um, as, um, uh, as I have experienced it and as Solzhenitsyn and others are, are telling me about this, is this attitude uh, of, you know, I don't care. I truly have lost the ability to care about X, Y, Z, okay? And I'll accept the consequences of that because I'm 100% in charge. So this is an aspect of, um, of an enlightenment wrinkle that I had not expected to encounter uh, this late in life. I just figured I'd go long and at some point I would die. Didn't realize I was gonna have to go repeatedly through these near-death experiences as a result of interacting with cancer. And, and I didn't want to get involved in cancer. It's a waste of my time to learn this shit. There's a bunch of, there's nothing I can do about it for most people. Anytime I try to do anything about it for most people, I'm going to run into the fucking medical associations. They're going to try and put me in jail for doing something for people, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It's just, it's a no net win for me. And I don't want to waste my time. But because I've been resistant, universe has just been bitch slapping me with this shit. So I've got to get into it. Uh, again, by way of introduction. So I've got an attitude, right? I've got the attitude as described by Solzhenitsyn, all right? And it's, um, uh, it's not a badass attitude. It's not like a fourth degree uh, brown belt kind of, um, or, or a brown belt attitude where, you know, you think you know something and you think you're a badass. This is just the case of, uh, I don't care how big you are. I have gone through pain you cannot imagine. And if you give me any shit, I'm going to inflict that pain on you because I know exactly how to do so having gone through it. And I've got to get on with my life and I'm not going to tolerate crap. And so, um, uh, whereas before I might have been deferential and might have just like let it roll off my back, you know, there's a new wrinkle in this. And so I've been getting back into Zen and... Um, uh, integrating it, basically, so I don't become a rude son of a bitch to most of the world, but I have no tolerance anymore. That's why I'm sitting here in a dark area with no electricity and so on. I had an electrician. Uh, this, progress, uh, this, this process of getting me an office built here has been ongoing basically for a year since we first moved here. True, the cancer cut out the first seven months of that effectively by making me weaker and weaker and weaker to the point I couldn't tolerate any kind of noise or anything around me. And we had to just stop all construction and so on. Then we picked it up again in fall and we've been working through it. And it's basically an old garage. I'll show you when I'm done. It's not that big. I think it's like 600 square feet. Um, and I, I, it's got a lot of electricity because I wanted to run 3D printers. I need to be able to plug in my uh, welder to the outside. This is assuming uh, my attitude continues and assuming my health continues and assuming my life continues. And there's all these questions about that relative to being a cancer survivor because you, 
you query, you wonder. There's no longer an assured sense that your body's going to keep ticking on. Anyway, so back to the story. Um, so I've got an electrician. And uh, basically, I deal with the, the old man who uh, I've told him, had, I hate meetings. Everybody should know that. And I had four meetings with him and said the same thing four fucking times over the course of uh, a year, over a year, because I actually had my first meeting with the electrician and telling him about the generalized things I wanted done around here and told him, just do it, I'll pay the fucking money. And none of it ever got done. And he's a passive aggressive son of a bitch. And I, and I don't like him. And, and it finally got to me when he delayed me yet again, because this should have been all done this past uh, Thursday. He was gonna, he promised to bring up a crew and hit it and quit it after two days. And well, didn't happen, so fuck him. Now I've gotta start all over again and it'll be five weeks or more before I've got electricity and, and all the other things I need to do and wire the greenhouse and so on. There's only about, I estimate 20 hours of work in it, 20 actual elapsed hours of work. Uh, my contractor estimates that it's 40. But even so, okay, even so. So I'm going to start doing as much of it as I can out during the days, doing little bits and pieces as I go forward while I'm waiting for the electrician, other electricians to free up a crew to come on up and bang out the rest of it, whatever I have yet to accomplish. And there's, you know, there's a fair amount of work. It'd be easier to have someone else do it and just pay the money. But I've got the attitude. And that attitude is my life is too short to fuck around with people I can't work with. And I refuse to be held hostage by this asshole's ability or inability to um, uh, schedule and uh, make his life work out. So fuck it. His karma is his own. I need not involve myself with it. My internal uh, peace of mind is much more um, uh, important than whether I get the electricity now or in five weeks. It was very important that I not be jacked around by this fucker because I'd made all these plans based on his... Um, assurances that it'd be done. And it's not like it's rocket science. I've, in, I've invented shit that's more complex, complex than what we've got to go through with this electricity. So, I've got to start spending a few hours a day, uh, you know, running cable through conduit out to the greenhouse and putting in uh, today's thing is to put in the wiring up there and then start getting ready to punch in the external uh, outlets. So, um, now getting back to the cancer. So it turns out that out of my seven, uh, samurai or seven savage, um, survivors here, uh, that three of us are really experiencing the attitude. <laughs> the longer you're a survivor with it, apparently the, the harder that attitude, um, grips hold of you. And so, um, so it's been very interesting. I've had some discussions in the last few days with, with all seven of the guys because I got some really interesting information that they needed to hear. And in the process, we, we discussed the attitude because I, I do realize that indeed um, uh, Solzhenitsyn was correct and, and it has crept over me. And he, he acknowledged in, in the character, as through autobiographically through the, the characters in the book, that he himself was experiencing this. And that it did not bode well for the for the state. By the way, that was this one of these running subplots through there. If you know how to how to read his books, that the um, the former Soviet state was fucking freaked about the attitude wherever it came from, and they did everything they could to not have it spread because it could spread. It got contagious. <laughs> so in that sense, the the cancer was contagious. Um, but it's just a brilliant book. Uh, if you don't have cancer and you like his writings and you've never, never read that one, it's a brilliant one. But it, um, it will spear you uh, where you are most vulnerable. And uh, so you've got to be prepared to be doing some serious bleeding when you read this. Anyway, though, so uh, cancer. All right, so I've done my survey, my initial survey. I'm going to be del delving down into this over the um, next few weeks, next few months, next few years, hopefully. Uh, terrible statistics. I was told one in three people survived the kind of cancer I have uh, for five years. And that's not true. These fucking allopaths, these doctors, these oncologists are dumb fuckers. And you dare not, if you're a cancer patient, leave your health and life in their hands because they don't know. When I actually um, did the research on the statistics and read the studies myself, it is not one in three unless you read that statistics a particular skewed way. And so I went to the trouble of buying um, 
reports and uh, uh, studies and these kind of things and read through them all, and it's about 14%. About 14% of the people that have long, slow-growing cancers survive six years the, after the uh, cancer is discovered and removed. This, and it does not matter whether, and this is con with conventional treatment, this is, this is 14 percent will survive six years, and even that doesn't tell the whole tale, okay? Because of that 14 percent that lives that six years, most of them that don't live die within the first two years, and then the others just kind of like trickle out uh, in the two years following, and then there's just a very few that are left to get into that sixth year. Uh, so it's quite um, that gives rise to the attitude, right? It's like, fuck you, dude. I got cancer. You know, ain't shit you can do to me. As far as I can tell, I'm not going to be around in six years anyway. So do your worst. Um, you know, uh, <laughs> you know and, and truly, this is why I'm calling all these guys Samurais, is because uh, we're all fighters. We're all um, mean, tough old fuckers uh, that have gone through a lot. Um, some of these guys have been, um, you know, we're through many tours in Nam. Uh, two and three tours. Uh, Agent Orange is the most likely culprit for the cancer thing in their uh, case and so on. So uh, it's a matter of you got to get your own internal attitude and get gritty about it. You know, you're going to survive as long as you can. And then there's the many, many, many other aspects of it. Um, there's that weird ass movie Galaxy Quest where the bad guy lobster head comes on up and says, you know, basically tell me the secrets or I'll give you pain such as you can never imagine. Well, he can't threaten me. Those guys kind of can't threaten me. I've had pain that I could never have imagined, and I'm still here. Uh, I can still recall that pain and pull it up any time I want because it was so brutal for so long. This is, this is similar to all of my seven survivors. But what I had to tell him was real quick, and I'm going to uh, get to it right now and not waste anybody else's time because I've got to get on and do shit as well. Um... In the survey, so far, I'm quite convinced that Linus Pauling and Adam Hoffler and a few of their cohorts in the late 60s and early 70s uh, were themselves correct in their assumptions or their conclusions about what cancer was and how to deal with it as a patient. And I'm going to go do a whole series of videos and we're going to get deep into this shit. But at the moment, here's an overview, and if you're a cancer patient or a non-cancer patient, there's some takeaways from this that can potentially save your life and prevent you from ever having to go through pain such as you cannot imagine. And so here's the, um, here's the takeaways. Cancer can be, uh, I'm talking about people like Linus Pauling and so on, Nobel Prize winner, you know, two-time two Nobel Prize winner, staggeringly brilliant and cut off and just isolated by the American Medical Association and their, and their various little um, uh, weasel associations because he was telling people things that could not make them money. So the individuals, it's a, the solutions to a, lot, to a lot of cancers and so on, and the prevention of cancer could be very, very, very cheap. We just don't understand, or we're not told this and how, how it works. Okay, so uh, the prevention aspect of this and potentially even a cure is vitamin C. And the reason that this is, is, is very complex has to do with the nature of your body and how vitamin C helps you resist these particular hormones that assault the cells. Okay, and so vitamin C in, in many cases can, uh, uh, will prevent cancer, will stop cancer, and will um, uh, potentially be uh, available as an anti-tumor agent, okay? And, and um, I'm going to get into depth into this, but uh, the, the issue is that humans are among four major species on the planet that don't build a, a vitamin C in ourselves. Uh, my little dog is uh, making, uh, she's 70 pounds, and she makes 4,500 micrograms um, of vitamin C a day, just in the follicles of her fur. It's that critical. What happens is this, um, cut to the chase. Uh, cancer is the cell that's gone rogue. It is no longer under the control of the body. So it is one of your own cells that gets batshit. The reason it gets batshit and, and gets loose is that the, something happens to what's called, to your, your what's called epigenome. This is a, a layer in your body that controls your genetics, that turns on your genetics and turns them off. This epigenetic um, effect can get wonky, and, and one of these cells doesn't get the appropriate information when it, when it 
uh, is uh, created by its parent cell. Not all the chromosomes go over. So it's a chromosomal damage that occurs. This is why 5G, even Wi-Fi. Here I am sitting 100 feet from, <laughs> from the Wi-Fi receiver and it, or, or broadcaster, and it's going through the, um, uh, the two through the walls of this building and then through the walls of the house to get out to here, and I've got no problem with it. <coughs> going to be able to live stream from here. That's a good thing for me live streaming, but it's a bad thing for me radiation-wise because I'm being bathed in 3 and 4G Wi-Fi at an incredible um, intensity. This is not good because it's that kind of shit. It's radiation, it's UV, um, it's even stress. It's any number of things that, that cause your epigenetic... A layer on your body to change and thereafter you have cancer even if you don't ever see even if you die from a, some other form uh, some other um, um, cause before any kind of cancer is ever found you've got cancer because what's actually happening is that that epigenetic control is no longer active therefore you're going to have more and more and more and more and more of these cells that go rogue when they go rogue, they steal as much food and nutrients as they can. They want to invade other parts of your body. They secrete hormones to do that. Vitamin C is the blockage for those, those, hormones, those hormones. The reason that it's the blockage is because what happens is that vitamin C is necessary to collagen, absolutely necessary to the production of collagen in you. That's why, hey women, pay attention. If you want really nice skin, load yourself up on vitamin C because it plumps up uh, your ability to make and maintain collagen at a tremendous level. And in fact, one of the first kinds of expressions of a lack of vitamin C in the process of getting scurvy is the degradation of the skin. So, um, so pay attention, as I say, maximize vitamin C. In a general rule, just to be safe on kind of this kind of thing, you need to have 30 grams of, micro, of um, vitamin C per day per kilogram of body weight. So, um, uh, right, and the reason that, by the way, the reason that my cancer did not metastasize and didn't really kill me probably was because throughout its entire time that it was inside me, I was taking supplements that had some level of vitamin C in them. Nowhere near what I should have been taking to prevent the cancer, but enough to keep it basically corralled. So a side effect of the fact that I was trying to take vitamins to plump myself up and, and fight this general degradation that I didn't know at that time was cancer, was doing things that actually aided me in keeping that cancer as contained as it ended up being. So um, 30 micrograms per kilogram. So I'm about 100, let's just say, call it say 165 pounds uh, at the moment. I've gained back about 25 pounds, putting on muscle mass, using my equipment here, and it's, it, you know, all that part's good. And so what I'm doing is I'm taking enough vitamin C to equal 30 times the, the basically 70 kilograms to 75 kilograms that I weigh. You take your body weight, if, if you know it in pounds, divide it by 2.2, and that's how many kilograms you, you weigh. Multiply that by 30, and that's how much micrograms per day of vitamin C you need. Now, don't freak out because it's going to end up being three to 4,000, uh, two to 3,000, or, or three to 4,000, depending on how big you are. Vitamin C goes into the intercellular membranes, the collagen, the, um, all aspects of the intermass that holds all your cells together. And so without that, what happens is that the, the cancer comes along, secretes a hormone that opens up that area between those cells, and it invades. But if you've got um, uh, vitamin C, vitamin C repels that hormone through, the, this oxygen, or through this electron exchange thing, and then off, off you go. That cancer cell attempted invasion has not nowhere to go. It's wasted that hormone. It's it's lost some resources in having done so, and eventually it dies through apoptosis when it can't succeed in in going through and, and getting to the next phase. Right. So cancer is thought to be in in four phases. What's interesting is that if um, if it never gets out of phase one, it dies. And so it has to go to some level of attachment to your body somewhere to continue to get nutrients and then to force through hormonal excretions the creation of blood vessels into itself um, in order to get more energy. And that's this transition from phase one to phase two. If it doesn't have that, then within a relatively short period, that can individual cancer cell or that cluster is, is killed and excreted out of your body. We as, as humans, by the way, don't have antibodies for cancer. Duh. Next generation, let's build that in. 
Anyway though, um, so vitamin C, 30 milligrams per kilogram. So 30 times uh, the basically 70 to 75 uh, kilograms that I'm likely to be measured out to uh, brings me into about 2,400 micrograms per day. Now that's a bare minimum. The, you'll note that the uh, RDA and the US minimum is around 60 up to 120 milligrams, so way low. Now uh, here I am trying to get 2,400 milligrams, but if I take a couple of uh, ascorbic acid capsules, you know, vitamin C caps that are a gram each, a thousand milligrams each, for every thousand milligrams of vitamin C in that form that I ingest, only 200 are going to get into my blood. When I talk about 30 micrograms per kilogram, I'm talking about the amount of vitamin C that's circulating in your blood, and that's the way that they measure it as a ratio. And so, the, um, uh, so I would have to eat a lot of these 1,000 milligram capsules uh, at only 200 uh, uh, micrograms, be, or 1,000 uh, mil, uh, micrograms with only 200 micrograms being absorbed in order to get to the 2,400 uh, micrograms that I need bare minimum and what I'm trying to do is get better than that I'm trying to get optimal for my body and everybody's body is going to be slightly different so you know, the range here is going to be very much higher or lower the problem with this is vitamin C is a really good laxative vitamin C is a very good laxative it's safe easy effective doesn't cause any problems uh, you know it doesn't trash your system you don't have to worry about plumping up on uh, probiotics afterwards any of that and so you have this thing called bowel tolerance. And bowel tolerance on ascorbic acid can be lower than the amount of ascorbic acid you need to get it into you to meet your minimum requirements at 30 uh, micrograms per kilogram. There are other alternatives though. The other alternatives turn out to be really skookum, okay? There's injection, you can get IV um, vitamin C, and they use that approach in hospitals to treat people with cancer. As an actual assault on the cancer itself, they pump you up with IV vitamin C. And that IV vitamin C can get 700 micrograms per kilogram into you. So, every, or, um, excuse me, 700 grams per gram into you, 700 micrograms per gram into you. So uh, every gram you consume that way, you end up with 700 so, uh, you know, 700 divided into 2,400, so you wouldn't have to take anywhere near the same amount. There's an even better way than that. It doesn't involve needles. This is liposomal uh, vitamin C. Liposomal vitamin C is vitamin C encapsulated in little uh, lipids that go through the stomach so it's not destroyed, and, and it gets absorbed in the, in the intestine. And uh, liposomal vitamin C is more expensive than regular vitamin C but you have to take far less of it to reach the level of doses that you actually need to maintain an anti-cancer protection. The reason you need that anti-cancer protection is the fucking radiation that we're all uh, being bombarded with such that our epigenetics uh, triggers are um, getting um, screwed with by uh, the radiation and, and other health hazards, the carcinogens and so on. Bear in mind it was the carcinogens and the chemicals that were in, uh, being introduced into our environment in the 70s that were the great cancer sur uh, scourge. They were um, uh, trimmed out through legislation. Now we've got radiation. So we're gonna have to go through the same process all over again and trim out the radiation through legislation the same way we did with all the cancer-causing chemicals, um, uh, you know, f 50 years ago. So now vitamin C at this level, liposomal, gets 800 micrograms per gram ingested. So better than IV. Um, the thing to watch out for, in my opinion, is don't get hooked on a particular brand of the uh, liposomal if it contains soy. If you're a male, you shouldn't con consume soy at all in this country, in my opinion, because of both the GMO issue as well as the um, uh, phytoestrogen issue. Uh, but you can find uh, liposomal vitamin C that's been encapsulated in sunflower lecithin. Sunflower lecithin ha is not quite neutral in terms, it's a little bit negative kind of a substance um, in general, uh, but the, the net negative amount is minimal compared to the vitamin C that you can get in that way. So liposomal vitamin C is the, is the route to go, and you need to get up to 30 
micrograms per kilogram. Uh, if you use liposomal, it's at that 800 per gram ratio that you're ingesting. So you can do the math there and figure out how many grams of this stuff you need to, to take during a day. With vitamin C, something else. It's also helpful to, to spread it out throughout your entire day such that before you go to bed, if you can do it with your gut, if you're not reaching bowel tolerance, then it'll keep you going through the night, take some before, late at night before you go to sleep. Another thing about this is you'll find that people that want to saturate themselves with vitamin C to get it up to the level that is um, uh, maximal will go through a number of days of reaching bowel tolerance. And uh, it's, not, it's not particularly gruesome and, and it helps detox. It's also antiparasitical to do it this way. Um, so uh, that's, that's the basic message at this stage relative to cancer that, that the seven of us have been um, uh, discussing. There's the other aspect of it, which is the mushrooms, the, which include the reishi, chaga, which is mentioned in the cancer ward, um, uh, lion's mane, turkey tail, uh, cordyceps, and a few others. And these uh, medicinal mushrooms bring in beta-glucans, polysaccharides, and triterpenes that are all active anti-cancer uh, agents in, in multiple different forms. There's also a big discussion I'm going to be doing about C60 as an anti-cancer agent because it's also an antioxidant the way that vitamin C is. Now, vitamin C does stuff that is beyond um, the antioxidant component of it. But the negative part of vitamin C is that if once a vitamin C molecule meets that hormone that it has to neutralize, that hormone is neutralized, but so is that vitamin C molecule. So you've got to replace that vitamin C molecule ASAP if you're getting bombarded by these hormones from the fucking cancer. So, uh, so you see, it's a continuous kind of thing. You've got to keep it up. Uh, this is why in order to survive, you've got to get the attitude. Well, I'll do more of these. Uh, there's a lot more you can do. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm not trying to make money off of them. You'll note that these videos are monetized, but that's only as far as I'm concerned. That's only so I can get them into the, um, uh, the search engine. Uh, YouTube has a tendency to not apply the same algorithms to searches and apply the results in, to the uh, non-monetized videos. So they, it favors monetized videos because that's where YouTube makes its money. You can't blame them. Anyway, so I'm gonna, you know, I've been in this for a long time and I'm um, gonna monetize the video, put it out there, and continue this series uh, because it's part of my attitude. It's like, I'm really pissed. I'm really pissed no one told me this, you know, 60 years ago. I'm pissed I wasn't told this shit in school. I'm pissed that they didn't uh, dump vitamin C in me the way that they did fluoride. I'm pissed that I didn't get uh, medicinal mushrooms as part of my diet as a kid, uh, the way they gave me vaccines and other, other fucking shots. So I got the attitude. And it's like, okay, um, <laughs> we'll see how it plays out. <laughs> Bye. I got to get some more coffee.